scary. <laughs> they mix this up. They, they mix this up. Yeah, you guys sit over there somewhere, and I'll sit over here. <laughs> All right, well, uh, this weekend has uh, been in a long time. We've been planning it for a while now, and um, kind of the way that this all came together is uh, with uh, a good friend Landry, who is also a sea coaster. And Landry, um, I want to start with him a little bit because uh, Landry, if you don't know, is also a professional basketball player. And uh, they, uh, him and Jeremy, kind of have their crawl, their paths crossed a bit and became friends and kind of uh, more than just friends in basketball and faith as well. well every game was kind of you could hear the other team like arguing, like, oh, I want to guard him, oh, I want to guard him. Um, <laughs> and, uh, you know, I was always the one that everyone wanted to guard um, before the game started, and it was just, uh, it's just funny um, kind of to hear from Landry's perspective um, how me and Landry met. Um, so I, I grew up in Palo Alto, which is literally across the street from Stanford, so I would grow up going to all the Stanford games, um, hoping one day I could play there. Uh, it's actually true, like, my, I just really, really didn't want to go to Harvard. Um, I really wanted to go to Stanford just because I want to stay in California. Um, it's good weather, in and out burger, you know, the whole thing. <laughs> and uh, so we were at a camp. I was hurt at the time, but I, you know, I, wanted, I wanted to go just to show them I was really interested. And that's when I first saw Landry. I never met him at the time, but I saw him. I knew he was one of the kids that they were recruiting, so I was, like, hoping that he wouldn't do very well. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he ended up, he was by far the best kid um, at that camp, and uh, that's when I was like, man, this guy's a real deal. Um, they got to give him a scholarship. So basically, uh, he took my scholarship to Stanford. <laughs> uh, fast forward to the NBA draft, going through the whole thing. I had my best workout was with the Knicks. And so after the workout, D'Antoni, Mike D'Antoni was the coach at the time, pulled me into his office. He's like, hey, uh, we have the 39th and 40th pick. I think that's right, right? 39 and 40? Yeah, back to back. back yeah, and uh, they're like, Dude, you, you, you play really well. Like, hopefully, hopefully things work out. I was like, cool. Uh, draft night comes around, um, you know, with the, with the pick. We choose Landry Fields from Stanford. And I was like, all right, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> Took my spot again. <laughs> So, um, but I, at, this, at this point, I had already worked out with him during the summer and stuff, so there was a, you know, there was a, a, the beginning of a friendship, so I was happy for him, uh, really sad for myself, um, and, and then eventually we ended up playing together on the same team in New York, and from there, I think, pretty much when I got there, um, we just started hanging out a lot, and um, so basically that's how I knew Landry, and we've kept in touch and, and been close friends ever since, so um, that's kind of my how it all started with, with him. Tell us a little bit about your faith journey as well. So yeah, you and Landry uh, had similar journeys when it came to basketball, but similar and yet different journeys when it came to faith. Yeah, for me, my faith, um, you know, I grew up in the church, so I knew everything about the stories and all the Sunday school stuff. And um, when I first, my, my faith, like I got baptized when I was a freshman in high school because at that point I joined the youth group. And that's when I realized um, there's a different type of feel to this community. There's a different type of love, something that I don't necessarily see in school or among my peers. Um, there's something just different. And so that's when, I, for me, it became real. Um, and that was the beginning. Um, and then two points where I really, really struggled was when I first got to college and when I first got to the NBA. Um, those were big transitions in my life, and I didn't have that built-in community around me. And I don't think I fully understood the the gravity of the temptations I would face and, and how difficult it would be. And, um, you know, in college, I ended up joining a, a, a Christian fellowship, and then eventually I ended up leading a, a small group there, and that's kind of where my faith took off again. And then again in the NBA, um, after my first, you know, I would say after my first year and a half um, is when I was able to take another step spiritually. So um, that's kind of my faith journey in a nutshell. So you guys both uh, go to some somewhat decent colleges and stuff like that. <laughs> so we mentioned this last night is uh, Biola University also has a basketball team. <laughs> uh, but if you're a real Christian, you probably would go there. But uh, it's fine. It's fine. Jesus is there. Building two stories. Go check it out. Uh, anyway. Uh, so you, you both go through school and you both make it into the NBA and you have um, kind of different journeys a little bit from, from there on out. So why don't you guys talk through your first couple seasons? 
basically my first year, so me making it to the NBA was, at that time, I just couldn't believe it. It was, uh, like I, I just, I never thought I would make it really. And the fact that I made it was a, a miracle in and of itself with the way everything played out with Summer League. And so I thought I was going into this, you know, this thing where I was really gonna kind of break out. And basically the exact opposite happened my rookie year. Um, I had, uh, I, got, I got sent to the D League all three times. Um, <clears throat> and uh, there were some, some nights where I wouldn't even dress. So you can only dress 13 out of 15 players. And so even though I was completely healthy, I was still in suit and tie. And um, I would never get in the game uh, unless we were, you know, up by 20 or down by 20. At that time, I played for the Warriors and we weren't that good. So most of the time we were down by 20 was when I would get in. And, uh, and it was just, it was uh, really embarrassing for me because, you know, there was a lot of hype surrounding me, the fact that I made it. And so there was a lot of attention around that. And uh, I just really struggled with pressure and anxiety. Because I think for me, uh, I, I just, I had a lot of people supporting me at the time. Um, a lot of them were Asians, and a, a, lot, a lot of people from China, a lot of people from Taiwan, a lot of Asian Americans in the US were really supporting me. And so I put this tremendous pressure on myself, you know, like, hey, I'm this pioneer, this trailblazer, I gotta, you know, I gotta, I gotta represent for everybody. And uh, it ended up really like killing me from the inside in terms of I couldn't eat before games, I couldn't sleep before games. Um, there was just tremendous anxiety. I mean, the anxiety to the point where I just hated game days. Um, any day there was a game, I mean, I'm playing professional basketball, I'm playing in the NBA, like, any day there's a game, I was just like, oh my goodness, not another game day. And when the game would end, I would just be so relieved, um, I'd be so happy. And I think for me, that whole first year, I was just really learning from a faith standpoint of what does it mean to play for God, or what does it mean to live for God and not to be defined by, you know, your job or what other people think of you or even your own personal dreams and ambitions. And um, that's kind of uh, what I learned my first year. Going into my second season, um, I had gotten cut by the Warriors, got picked up by the Rockets. I went to the Rockets and got cut again. And then um, actually at that, at that moment, um, and you know, while I was still at training camp with the Rockets, I actually packed up all my stuff. I, I took everything out of my locker. I left the locker room and I called my agent. I said, hey, you can go ahead and tell him I'm not coming back. And uh, at that time, it was just, I couldn't do it anymore. Um, I didn't want to be there because they had, basically every team you can only have three point guards and there were six at, at training camp and three of them were under contract. I wasn't one of them, or three of them were guaranteed. So I knew that I was going to get cut. So I packed all my stuff up. I was like, okay, I'm not coming back. And obviously he had to talk me into not doing that. So I had to go back and put all my stuff back in my locker, which is <laughs> pretty embarrassing. Um, but, uh, and so that was like a really low point in my life. And, and then next thing you know, I get picked up by New York and uh, completely unexpected. And, and actually the reason why they picked me up was kind of because the workout that I had um, the, the, you know, the NBA draft workout that I had a year and a half ago. And so it's, it's funny how God, you know, uses everything. But um, then we ended up in New York together and that was just, um, you know, that, that was the start of it all. And, and for me, uh, I felt like God was kind of just constantly humbling me and testing me and seeing, you know, how much of your life will you surrender? And when I, I felt like when I got to a certain point, he did something so much bigger and beyond my imagination. Like I never, ever would have dreamed like insanity would happen the way it happened. And um, I, I wish I could sit up here and be like, yo, I'm, I'm awesome. Like I knew it was gonna happen. <laughs> um, like I willed it to happen. But uh, I know, I know there's so many like coincidences that are out of my control, out of my control um, in order for that to happen the way it did. And I always describe it as this perfect storm of things that happened. Even the fact that I got picked up by New York I wasn't supposed to get picked up by them, but the Rockets were trying to keep me. And so they told me to, they waived me basically like 24 hours later than they were supposed to. And then because of that, uh, the New York Knicks had a player named Iman Shumper who got hurt. And then right when he got hurt, that's the only reason why they picked me up. But if I had gotten cut at the normal time, that waiver wire window, it's really complicated. Basically, I wasn't supposed to end up, on, I wasn't supposed to be on the Knicks and I ended up being there. And a lot of it was just divine. And so um, that's kind of how I ended up crossing paths with, 
with Lanny. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, 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 basically, there was a six week window where either I was going to get cut or I wasn't. And so for six weeks, I didn't know what was going to happen with my life. And I wasn't going to, if you're in the middle of Manhattan, you're not going to find an apartment. There's no six week apartment. <laughs> um, that's just not how it works. It's all 12 months or more. And uh, my brother lived there at the time, so I said, hey man, I'm, I'm just gonna crash on, your, crash on your couch for six weeks. And he was like, no problem. And, uh, but then one weekend he had friends in town. He was like, hey, uh, you know, your, your spot on the couch is taken. Is <laughs> <laughs> this is the third time your spot gets taken? Yeah. 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 I'm surprised it wasn't Landry. <laughs> yeah, my spot was taken again. I was like, of course. <laughs> yeah, he did. We were gonna cut you, and then I was just like, "Hey, why don't we just give this kid a chance?" Um, and basically, there's it was it was the back to back to back that um, there was really no time to bring somebody else in or cut me, and so they're just like, "Hey, we'll throw you in and see what you can do. At least give you a chance." And that was kind of the breakout game. And my agent had kind of told me before, he's like, hey, "You, you got to do well, otherwise this might be it for you." And um, <clears throat> I talked about my anxiety before, and uh, normally before games, I'm like, you know, I'm like really, really tense, really anxious, and for whatever reason before that game, I was just so calm and peaceful, and, and it's, it never normally happened like that. Um, maybe it was the couch, maybe I don't know what it was, but I, it was the couch. But I just had like no nerves, and um, you know, I told this story last night where for my pregame meal, I went to Papaya Dog, and had like corn dog, french fry, burger, like just the worst possible pregame meal you could have. But at that point, I was just like, all right, whatever, man. Like, if this is it for me, I gotta at least, I gotta enjoy it, this is my last game. And I just went in there and I was totally calm. It was just like supernatural peace that God gave me. And, uh, you know, my career high at that point was 12 points. And so, <clears throat> like, basically, if, <laughs> If I scored like four or five points, I was like, that's a great game for me. Um, I was feeling really good. Anytime I scored four or five points, because most nights I, I didn't score. And so they put me in that game, and after the first half, I had six points and like three or four assists. I think that was a career high in assists at the time, was like three or four. So I was like feeling really good about myself. I was like, man, if I don't do anything else the rest of the game, like I still did really well. And then in the second half, uh, it was just, it was just crazy. I just got in the zone and ended up with 25, 25 points and, uh, and we got the win. And, uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, it was just really, it was, it, was, it was the grace of God because I, just, I had been in that position so many times where I was just thrown into a game and it, I was just com fall completely flat on my face. And that had happened so many times and just the fact that I was at the very end, and that's how God always seems to work in my life, is like, hey, when it's like the very end, um, right before, he always does something miraculous. He always, that's how he's always proved to me, like, hey, Jeremy, like, I'm right here with you. I'll never leave you. I'll never abandon you. Like, wherever you go on your journey, I always have you. And that's how I got into the NBA, too. I talked about in summer league. It was kind of like the last shot that I could make it to an NBA roster. Um, and all of a sudden, I had this breakout quarter and that's why I made it. And so it's kind of a reoccurring theme for me, but that night was something really special and uh, I'll never forget it for sure. Um, to be able to describe the journey, like that, that stretch, I, I couldn't do it justice in, in, in just explaining it to you. It's just, I don't know, man, like it was crazy. It was just the most ridiculous things were happening. Um, I mean, me and Landry came up with a very nerdy handshake, and it was like the hottest thing out there. <laughs> what is going on? Um, I don't know, like, we were, it, it seemed like every night, everything, like, it would just grow bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, the fans and whatever would get crazier and crazier. And um, I think, how did we try to stay focused? I mean, we definitely both made a lot of mistakes. Um, there were definitely times where, we let everything catch up to us. We let we let the hype catch up to us. But I know Landry makes me sound like you know I did everything for his faith, but um, he did a lot for me too. In that he, he was the first NBA player that I could really open up to about faith, and we talked about Christianity, and um, you know he had questions, I had questions, but we we talked about it regularly, and that was really weird for me because in the NBA, you know, 
You know, it's like, it's all about being like a man, you know, like you be a man, you don't talk about your feelings or emotions. <laughs> man up and get your way through it. You know, that's kind of like the mantra or whatever. That's, that's how people, that's how people think. And, and so to open up is kind of, uh, uh, it, it's soft or it's weak, but that's something that we did and um, we talked about it so regularly and then we ended up having actually one Bible study um, at the end of the season with the Knicks where we got a lot of the guys who, um, you know, maybe would make fun of Christianity or jokingly or whatever, but they actually came to the Bible study. And, and I don't think I ever would have had that courage to do it if Landry wasn't there, like, encouraging me as well. And so there's definitely um, this accountability. We can talk about stuff, trying to keep each other accountable, we try to help each other. And um, it was just, it just made me a lot more confident or bold in my faith to know that there's someone else who, who knew what I was talking about. And um, that, which to me, was uh, really, really helpful. And then that helped me have courage to be able to like do Bible studies on my the teams that I was on afterwards. So you know, in LA um, with the Lakers, we had Bible study, and, and with the Hornets, we had Bible study, and, and that kind of all started in New York um, when when we when we did that thing, you know, that one Bible study together. Um, at that time, when it first all kicked off, I was just loving life, um, and uh, I was just. Being on ESPN was pretty awesome to me. You know, I go to that website every day. And so I was like on the front page of ESPN all the time. It was like, I didn't really like all, love all the lens buttons. Some of them were a little uh, lame to me. But the fact that I was there, I was like, man, this is awesome. And so every night I was like, I was on ESPN. I was, uh, you know, I was on GQ. I wore sweats every day, but they somehow got me on GQ. <laughs> um, and there was just like this, an uh, unbelievable amount of attention and fame, and, I was, and, and for the first two weeks, I was like, man, this is ridiculous, this is awesome. Uh, people were like coming by my apartment, dropping off cheesecake, like, you know, <laughs> most random stuff. It was just like, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on. It was more than cheesecake, let me tell you. I went to, first of all, you got his, his, his whole condo for free, that's a whole other story. <laughs> in the middle of New York, you know how expensive that could be. But I'd go in there, and things were like stacked like to the wall. There was like a Jeremy Lin jersey in fruit roll up. Like, <laughs> I'm like, that's creative. And so I'm like, I, I got smart. I'm like, well, next time I come over, I know what I'm doing. So I'm not going to go the next time, and I got a huge duffel bag. And I'm like, dude, you're not going to take all these tin watches and all these clothes right here and this cheesecake. I will take that fruit roll up thing if you don't want it. <laughs> And so it was like, it was like the world thrown at him. So I just gotta set that up for, for you guys. Like, it wasn't just a cheesecake. It was like <laughs> any and everything you want, it was at his disposal. Yeah, it was pretty ridiculous. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I took full advantage. It was like, it was boxes. Like, every day I come home and there's, you know, three boxes like this high, which is free. Go. You just, you would open it and you didn't know what was in there. It'd be clothes one day, it'd be whatever. But um, it, we had everything, I mean, it was remarkable. And then I remember uh, about two weeks after the stretch, we were playing the Bulls in Chicago. I was taking my pregame nap. And it was at this point where the anxiety started to come back. And uh, I was just kind of thinking to myself, like, what's going on? And uh, I just realized at that moment, I was just so fixated on, like, all right, well, what's next? That's kind of how we're wired as humans, you know? like. Uh, if you think about what society defines as success, it's kind of like, oh, you go to high school, get good grades, so you can go to college, get good grades, so you can get a good job and have, you know, stability and wealth, and then you have a family, blow up, and then once you achieve all that, it's like, all right, well, what's next? Then you want the same exact thing for your kids, right? And so it's this never-ending cycle where we're always chasing the next thing. And for me, I was like, really empty because I was like, man, I played well last game, but tonight I have Derrick Rose, and I gotta play well against him. And even if I do well, there's still another game. And even if I kill it this season, there's still next season. And um, that's something that always stuck out to me, was just, I'm always chasing this next goal. And so in that moment, two weeks after this whole insanity stretch, before this game, I was, I, I was sitting there by myself in my hotel room, and I was like, I, I can't remember the last time I felt this empty. And, uh, and, and this, is the, this is the most realest thing, the most realest feeling I ever had, because if you, if you ask me what's that one moment you remember from insanity, it's not the game winner. I do remember that. I, it's, it's, not, it's not the game against the Lakers or whatever. It's really this one moment that really, really hit me and, and made me realize, wow, if this isn't enough, then what is? And 
Uh, that's when it all started for me where I talked about, hey, after a year and a half in the NBA, I realized I need to take another step spiritually. It, it started with that one moment where I was like, hey, I have everything in the world. I'm on Time Magazine. I'm one of the Time 100 most something like influential people or something like that. And I was on Sports Illustrated and all these things. It was like everything was coming together for to, to make me into this like beyond human superstar. And it still wasn't enough. And so uh, there was just something that really stirred. God was really working in my heart at that time to show me, hey, um, this isn't what life is about. Um, like accomplishing these things does not define you. So I want to make sure before we run out of time, because I think probably as far as your faith goes, the most impactful time of your basketball careers was not necessarily the time where you felt uh, like you're on top of the world, but it was the times that you felt the lowest, and I think that's true for both of you. So, in our remaining time, can you tell us about how that refinement started to happen in your faith uh, as you maybe started to lose all the uh, all the accolades, or at least weren't at the top of the game right there? Yeah, um, I don't know. Uh, basically, after the season, I, I hurt my knee, and after the season, the next three years were the most some of the most difficult times in my life. And, uh, you know, at first off, I, I left New York, I ended up with the Rockets, and I didn't know why or how, and I didn't understand. I, I was expecting to go back to New York, I wanted to go back to New York, and it didn't happen. And from there, everything just started to slowly, you know, slip out of my hands. Um, so I played really well, I was starting, I was loved by the whole world, and then criticism starts to come in, and then my stats start to go down, and then, um, I start to, you know, and then all of a sudden I'm coming off the bench, and so those two years in Houston, I really struggled with, God was really testing me, like, hey, if I take this stuff away, are you going to be okay? Or is this, is this all that defines you? And so I start to lose that, and I got traded to the Lakers, and we all know how that season went. Um, <laughs> won 21 games, and in the middle of that season, we were playing the Spurs, and I was completely healthy and I didn't even touch the court. That was my first time I had a, a DN, I did not play since, uh, since my time with the Knicks before the insanity. And so it was like, I started at, you know, not playing and then all of a sudden I had achieved all this and then slowly through the course of three years, I lost everything I back to that point where I wasn't getting into an NBA game. And I can tell you, uh, this, was, this was something that I never, ever, ever want to experience again in my life. But if I could go back, uh, it's, it's the one thing that I would say I, I, could not, I could not give this experience up for anything else because it made my faith, it made me into such a different person where um, I'm no longer defined by the basketball. If you think about why I was so anxious, why I was unable to eat or sleep before games, why I would break down in tears after bad games and things like that, it's because I was so, it was such a big item in my life. Like basketball was everything to me and I couldn't, I couldn't find a way out of it, and, and God just did it for me by slowly taking these things away from me. And, um, and that, that's the best thing that, I mean, he saved, honestly, he saved my life, and he saved my soul because, because I was so caught up in everything. Even though I was trying not to, even though I was you know, saying the right things in the media, I was still letting it affect me. I was still letting it, you know, I was still trying to be in insanity at the end of the day. And, and that, to me, uh, you know, I, I was taking what God, God was at number one, and, I, and, and this whole insanity and basketball thing just started creeping up. And by God slowly forcing me out of my hands, he really tested my heart. He showed me, you know, how, how arrogant I was being, and he really brought me through a place of refinement that um, saved, saved my, my faith in a lot of ways. These guys have had a bit of a competitive spirit against each other, as you heard, and so I figured we would just settle it today, very quickly, okay? Is we're gonna have a little competition here, 30 seconds, who can make the most baskets, all right? <laughs> here we go, you guys, I need a couple, can I get a couple counters? You guys, awesome, yeah, yeah, yeah. Here. All right, real quick. You guys can count double digits, right? Perfect, okay, good. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. 30 seconds is gonna be on my clock here. Uh, what we're gonna do is you need to hold up the numbers in which they have made it so we can kind of gauge how it's going. I will keep, keep the clock. Ready? Three, two, one, oh, wow. go. <laughs> <laughs> Oh! <laughs> <laughs>
You got five seconds. Three, two, one. Frank. All right, what do you got? What do you got over here? What? 11, 12, Jerry wins. <laughs> Arvin. 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 Wow, right. What do you think these guys are being here with us this second? Yeah.